HF, HFL 250 class, um, I wanted to take some time and just share with you a little bit about my experience and also my understandings when it comes to low voltage systems and project management. And, and I subtitled it Devils in the Details. Um, there are probably a few systems like low voltage systems because there are so many of them dependent upon the scope and the scale of your project. They can um, create all kinds of havoc during a project. And it's, it is quite complex. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it depends on, um, again, the scope and the scale of the project. Even small projects that may seem to be pretty straightforward can get really, really, really hectic. And you can run into a lot of time delays uh, and, and cost issues as well and safety issues because low voltage systems get a little bit overlooked. I mean, it sounds surprising when we talk about these systems in a moment, some of these systems, um, you know, you might be thinking, well, of course, those would be considered. But you'd be surprised how often they're either not considered or really they're not looked at in enough depth and enough detail. Um, and this is where we really have to, um, you know, spend a lot of time on the front end. And that kind of is really part of the problem. It's really giving enough time to the front end of a project to really get into the information to make for a smooth project. Unfortunately, I think what does happen, and it's probably not that unusual, it's to react to what's coming as it's coming. And unfortunately, sometimes that's it's almost unpreventable um, because we pull the trigger on a project, we get rolling on it, and we're just left in a position of having to figure it out as we go. And that's going to happen. However, it's my humble opinion that we should spend as much time on the front end trying to get these details so that we can uh, avoid problems you know, down the road and avoid actually a lot of tension and anxiety down the road. Like anything else, you know, the more you plan, um, the, e the smoother it goes as you get into these projects. I, just, I think I believe that what happens, unfortunately, is a lot of folks who uh, don't do this kind of work on a regular basis what happens is they kind of think things just kind of happen um, more seamlessly than they do, and they don't sometimes understand the coordination that needs to go on in these projects. But let's talk about this. Let's let's talk about some of the details here. Let me spend about you know next 20 or 30 minutes just touching base on some of this and hopefully helping you as you go forward in your careers as HFL professionals. You know, I call this cables in a wireless world, and it's kind of an oxymoron, uh, an oxymoron to say a wireless uh, system because in our, really what you don't see behind the walls, um, most people don't understand, is there's just a lot of wires. And unfortunately, a lot of old wires that never get taken out and a lot of new wires that get put in. Here's just, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just a typical list of wires that you have in a wireless world. You know, nurse call systems, I mean, there's a lot of wireless technology being implemented with those, but yet there's definitely separate wires running through a nurse call system. Telemetry systems, um, those antennas that you see, sometimes they're whip antennas and anymore, I don't think you see any of the uh, VHF kind of like the uh, uh, old radial antennas anymore, uh, that's changed, but still, you still have a lot of telemetry um, in most hospitals, well, actually probably in all hospitals. Um, cellular antennas, again, in order to have seamless communications. There's wires for cellular antennas all over the place. Uh, monitoring, um, again, monitoring everywhere. You know, we need, we need monitoring for transport. We know we need to have monitoring when you move a patient from a room to imaging, to lab, to physical therapy, to wherever they're going to go. And so again, you have these, these, tie, these wires in the, in the ceiling as it relates to monitoring. Um, voice and data. Again, kind of goes without uh, saying that, you know, we have a lot of voice and data systems. Sometimes we have separate in-house voice and data systems that we use. Uh, medical equipment, again, various pieces of medical equipment can have uh, wireless technology and wires um, in the wall so that it can be, you know, portable and can move around the room. Entertainment internet has become um, a big deal. Um, you know, we have public internet now in almost every hospital. Uh, and then we have the you know, private internet in the hospital. There's all kinds of ports and hubs. Um, security it continues to grow more and more. You know, wireless cameras, um, even wireless, um, you know, c control access systems are becoming a little more popular. Uh, and of course, IT computing and charting. 
you know, that's a, it's a common thing to have nurses just being able to go down the hallway and be able to do their computer and their charting. And again, a lot of this wireless technology, unfortunately, um, results in a lot of cabling for us and not always at the same time. It's it, again, this is that's really the emphasis of this lecture is to talk about the coordination, um, the emphasize the coordination when it comes to technology and you as the HFO professional, you're kind of the center point. You're the you're the person sort of seeing all these pieces together. And if you again, if you look at this list, you can see how you could get into a world of hurt when it comes to the different companies or the different departments or the different entities that represent each one of these items. Um, you could be dealing with Verizon in one moment, dealing with uh, you know, Hillrom the next moment, dealing with who knows what ABC medical company the next moment, and next thing you know, you're dealing with your internal um, IT department, and on and on and on. And they're not all, they're sometimes they're very siloed, not necessarily working together. To another conversation, which is timely selection and cut sheets. And this is where the challenge really begins. Um, unfortunately, when people order products, they're not always thinking about the timing of ordering that product. They're often thinking about when they got to have the product project done. So, you know, if you have a project that's going to run X number of weeks or maybe even X number of months in many folks minds, they can order that product sometime near, you know, sometime before the project is done. And unfortunately that can create just all kinds of issues for us as you, as you already can surmise. And so we really have to be much further ahead, the lead time for selecting your product and really nailing it down and getting the cut sheets for it has to be really pretty far in the, in the planning stages, but it just doesn't happen as frequently or as, as timely as we like. Um, you know, it's always easier when the walls are and the ceilings are open, of course, to put anything in. I mean, nothing more beautiful than doing construction work when you have no one around except you and you got open walls and open ceilings and you can really lay things out and plan things. It's just, it's just beautiful versus having to go into a space that we have to tear it back open or you have to repeatedly open and close it. You know, how many times have we had projects out there where we've had to move the ceiling tiles, brand new ceiling tiles, multiple times because we have to keep going back up in those ceilings only to have to finally at some point replace a bunch of ceiling tiles because you know, they get damaged from all the opening and closing. And how many smoke penetrations and through through and fire pe penetrations through smoke and fire barriers have occurred, you know, repeatedly over and over and over again because you know each of these technologies happen singularly, you know, one week and then the next week and then the next week and maybe sometimes in the same day you may have different different people, you know, punching holes through penetrations. Hopefully, you know, if you have a newer hospital, if your hospital has been designed by some of the latest technologies, you have some of these. Uh, pass-throughs for cables that are actually designed to expand and you've had plenty of uh, design considerations where you have plenty of capacity to add cables and pull cables through making it a lot more easier to get through these smoke and fire barriers. Unfortunately, I would say that's probably still not the case for the vast majority of healthcare institutions that are out there. Um, it's just not that affordable and most facilities, are they didn't have those kind of uh, technologies back when the, they were built. You know, how many times do uh, we have, again, we kind of mentioned this already, but, you know, we go back and forth over and over again and we open ceiling tiles to run, to run, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the hallways and in the corridors and other places. Uh, and again, they get damaged. Uh, they, they just do. They get damaged. You know, you never know when you move a tile, you're going to be fighting a, uh, wires that are up there. Or you'll be fighting plumbing or medical gas lines or what. Um, and it seems like, you know, you always find the two or three spots where you can get to the ceiling and run cables, the same two or three spots, and you just, again, over and over again, have to replace ceiling tiles as they get damaged. You know, how many contractors to train? And this is a challenge, you know, when they come in, and if you're not, not in, uh, if you're not coordinating all the contractors coming into the facility, but they're being brought in by different departments, um, and, and they're getting by you, well, maybe they get no training at all. And kind of along with that thought is how many above ceiling permits to issue. You know, again, issuing these permits, every one of the entities that get above your ceiling, and maybe that's a bit of a misnomer because in many cases we don't have ceiling. Uh, it might be in a um, mechanical space or some kind of a um, you know, room that just doesn't have a ceiling, but yet they're working at a place 
where they need to have special training and knowledge and awareness, uh, either due to smoke or fire barriers and penetrations, or possibly even due to you know asbestos or issues like that, uh, or fireproofing. And then again, most of this work has to take place after hours. So you know, the more folks come in at different times, unsynchronized or uh, uncoordinated, you're going to have multiple people coming in after hours, which is going to cause your department to have to possibly mobilize supervision and security and others. Um, as the work takes place. And again, how many wall patches after the room is done? Um, nothing like thinking you're done with a room only to have to go back in and cut out, uh, you know, um, some kind of a hole to place uh, some kind of an outlet for cabling or communications or, or, or something. Um, and, and, and the worst case scenario is we have to actually tear out big parts of the wall to put an in infrastructure or backing to hang something on the wall. That, that's always really painful. Um, you know, fortunately these days we're, we're using a lot less paper and wallpaper and walls, but imagine the days when we use more and you had to cut it out and had to try to patch wallpaper. Uh, very hard to do, uh, let alone patching paint and, and things like that. So, you know, getting timely selection and cut sheets can help avoid most of these issues, if not all these issues. You can coordinate much better. Um, you know, you might even consider, and some people do go this far, I, I know of not too many, but they actually have a specific cabling teams that pull all the cables in their buildings versus having each vendor who brings their team or in some cases the in-house staff pull cables. And I'm, I'm kind of an advocate and not both ways for that. Uh, I think that could be a good thing, but also I think that we don't usually, it's hard to get man hours and manpower um, and to lose your man hours and manpower to projects like that when you're meant to be increasing your focus on you know, maintenance and operations and other things you have to do. Uh, it's not that it doesn't save money. It's not that we don't know how to do the work. It really is a matter of redirecting resources or maintaining your resources, which are getting thinner and thinner these days. Um, I believe that you know, contracting out is appropriate for a lot of reasons, but also you have to make sure they're trained and coordinated. But getting one team to do it on a consistent basis, I can see many, many benefits from that. Um, to help with these issues, especially if you have good cut sheets and good timing and you kind of plan out all the work. Um, again, even in a perfect world, you go through and you'll have all this plan and you'll have the cut sheets and you'll have the cable trays and you know where you're going to pull and you know the pay you're going to pull and you do all the work. And then, of course, something changes. Someone decides a different technology um, or a different boom or a different light or something different and then you have to do it anyway. Well, that, and that's just part of the game and, and it happens. Uh, you know, I, I like to see things be kind of neat and smooth and planned, of course, as, as I'm sure you do too, but unfortunately it, it doesn't happen all the time. But if we have the expectation and if we plant the seeds ahead of time, I think the outcomes are so much better um, that uh, we can actually hopefully train organizations to really want to do this ahead of time and do a lot more early work. Uh, again, this is an ideal situation, an ideal world, but it's why not push for the ideal and really kind of consider these things ahead of time. And I think that's a big part of it. I think if people know and understand, they're more likely to work with us. Really, it, how are we going to get this done? And it really comes down to teamwork. I mean, uh, I, I think this is part of the issue. We don't, we do work in such silos too often and we don't spend enough time pulling the team together and creating collaboration. Um, and this takes just, just, just time in creating these relationships. You know, the, the department management, it can't be understated, uh, overstated how important it is to have an engaged department manager or director or, depart or you know, staff. Uh, it, it's very different um, hospital by hospital and, um, you know, how and, and size and scope and scale, who are the decision makers Sometimes it's a director level, sometimes it's an administrative level. Very often it's a manager level. And then and, and not, not unusual for it to be supervisor or even staff level making the decisions on coordinating or picking equipment and you know this could infect you know the work. So having a good representation from that area in the right representation is critical. Identifying the key players. Can't say enough about IT. Um, again, for years they seem to operate in their own world because they seem to be a little different than everybody else, and you know their technology. Um, you know they, they kind of, I guess, just always had like a little their own world 
uh, but that's changed quite a bit. And, and people recognize now how much more integrated they are, especially with electronic medical record and things like that. But they, they really need to be on that team and they have buy-in. Um, they're the ones that we often blame for bringing in contractors, you know, when we're not around or uh, just letting them loose in the building. Materials management, I'm telling you, the, the, these folks, I mean, you gotta have a really great relationship with them because they're the ones that are helping you with the timing. You know, when that, when that, when that piece of equipment or when the cables or whatever it is, when the purchase order has been processed, they know and they can very much help you uh, coordinate timing um, and, and storage if you have to store something for a period of time. You know, great to have a great relationship with materials management and have them on the team. You know, clinical engineering, have to mention, you know, the clinical engineering folks are, again, they're the ones that are doing the installation. They're the ones that are often also working with different vendors on coordinating installations. And again, just it's important to understand if you have a good clinical representation of equipment and such, you need to have clinical or biomedical engineering on your team. Um, facilities, it, you know, goes without saying that they're, 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 they have to have facility representation. It's gonna probably be you, um, but at least somebody there to help coordinate. Um, environmental services, again, sometimes, and we make a mess and it's nice to have them and let them know that you're going to be someplace so they can go and clean and decon and wipe down or, or do whatever they have to do and really have your back uh, you know i've seen had too many situations where you know facilities goes in and we either coordinate the work or do the work only to get complaints uh, the next day that we didn't clean up properly and and again not that environmental services is always meant to be there to clean up after us because sometimes it's not even reasonable to aspect them to do that but it, there are times where it is good to say, hey, you know, can you go back into that room and, and clean that room when we're done and we're out of there? Um, security, again, need to have them there because, you know, technically you really want an engaged security department. You want them there not just um, so they can ensure that people are not on the property that, that should be there or not in a place at the hospital where they shouldn't be, but you want them engaged because security often can be representation of you when you're not around. I mean, sometimes you don't have to come in if you have a good relationship with security. You know, they will go a long way. Um, you know, I've had plenty of security folks that uh, were extremely competent maintenance people. Um, they could do a lot of things for us when we weren't there. And some of them, you know, obviously really, really wanted to. Others maybe, you know, not so much. But still, at the same time, their eyes and ears and presence, they can really help. And if something comes up, they can call you and bring you in. So maybe 80% of the time, you know, they don't need, you don't need to come in and 20% of the time, maybe you do. Well, that can be uh, only like that because security has an awareness and presence of what's going on. And truly, I've rarely, 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 if ever met a security person who didn't want to know what was going on in the hospital. I mean, most security officers that I've met, they, they really feel like they, they're kind of like protecting the hospital and they want to be aware of what's happening. And so it's really great to have them engaged and have them involved um, when you're doing things uh, with projects. And of course, the contractor. Um, it's nothing like having a contractor that you use regularly or even bringing new contractors in and setting the expectation from you know day one. You know, And again, if you can take this group of folks and you can develop that team and really, really help them understand you know, the complexities of our jobs, uh, you know, like anything else, if we do it right on the front end, it surely makes things a lot easier on the back end. And I th and again, I think that this can be perceived as, as really just a great collaborative uh, opportunities um, that'll make all of us look good as we go through and we, you know, we do these projects. So I hope, you know, this little present, this little lecture was helpful. Um, you know, again, probably rings true to many of you who've been working in facilities for a while. For those of you who have not worked in facilities or have been a healthcare professional, healthcare facilities professional, um, it will ring true. I mean, trust me, you know, small, big, medium, whatever kind of projects you get into, uh, these are, this is just kind of the, 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 the I don't say the tip of the iceberg, but this is pretty much core to what we have to kind of, you know, it's like herding, herding cats in a way. And we, that's what we do pretty much every day on projects is we kind of just sort of coordinate people who are working in silos and try to try to make the best possible outcome. And if you can do this, if you can really work on this and have this awareness from the get go, uh, it will absolutely um, make your career easier. And I think I think people will respect you as a facility professional as well along the way and give you more opportunities to you know be a trusted uh, uh, person in the organization. 
So that's it for the lecture. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and look forward to continuing on with you in this course.